question of today. If God is immutable, how come there are scripture references that use the words, but God repented? In order to tackle this question, let's split it up into two parts. First, let's discuss God's immutability found in scripture. It's clear that throughout scripture that God is unchanging in his nature and his desires as well as his thoughts. They're all unchanging. He is not variable. He is uh, consistent and faithful. Where do we find this concept throughout scripture? Well, first we find this in the Old Testament. Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord and I change not. We also find in Numbers 23, 19 that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? We also find in Psalm 102, verse 26 and 27, it says that they shall perish, but thou, talking about God, shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy year shall have no end. We also find in 1 Samuel 15, 29, it says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. So we find this in the Old Testament. And while this is Old Testament introduction, for sakes of the whole uh, unity in the Bible, uh, the New Testament talks about this as well. James 1, 17 says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from of God and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He's not variable. He doesn't have any variableness. And lastly, Hebrews 6, 17 and 18, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who hath fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set for us. So both the Old and the New Testament repeats the same idea and that we can conclude that God, he doesn't change. And while people may be unreliable, uh, situations may uh, be in flux and people change their beliefs and uh, a lot of us change throughout our lives, uh, God isn't. And he is, uh, he's not inconsistent, he's reliable and faithful. Scripture points out the fact that God is not a man, he's not a mortal or a human. He transcends variableness and he does not contradict his character. Early church fathers described this immutability as static perfection. If God is perfect, then any alteration uh, would be for the worse. So, however, this immutability can take, be taken a little bit uh, too far into deism. Uh, there have been many uh, that consider, they claim that God uh, must be without emotion uh, because emotions and feelings change. And so if God w- was that, he would be changing. That would be inconsistent uh, with the idea of immutability. Uh, but this can't be the case because we find all throughout Scripture that God has emotion. Um, God, God is involved in his creation, actively involved. We find this woven throughout all of Scripture. Um, we see this relationship between God and man uh, thoroughly intertwined. We see it, um, for example, the flood in Noah's ark. Uh, we see it in the Abrahamic covenant, God's personal relationship with Abraham, the friend of God. The exodus of the house of Jacob out of Egypt, uh, God's hand was all over that whole situation. Uh, God's presence in the tabernacle and in the temple, we uh, see in scripture the Shekinah glory, this cloud that filled the temple in such cases. And uh, we know of God's utilization of prophets, uh, using them to speak on his behalf. Uh, And of course, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Savior, uh, came to earth. Um, the ultimate form of God's relationship with man. And we find the indwelling of and filling of the Holy Spirit as well as prayer. And God has his hand in all of those situations and events. So the presence of emotions such as love, anger, hurt, and care, they're not indictments of God's immutability, but rather they're just outflows of his attributes. Divine emotion and immutability aren't mutually exclusive from each other. So we've talked about immutability. What about immutability? We've discussed this this idea that's found in Scripture. But then, what about this seeming contradiction that we see in Scripture? What about God's repentance 
as, as is seen, as we'll mention shortly. Dr. Colgen from Cornell University in an article of Ashland Theological Journal once said, she said, quote, God's character and purposes do not change, but he alters his specific actions in response to the actions of human beings. And that quote, God's actions are partly dependent upon what we do and on what we pray. So in essence, uh, God doesn't change, but maybe he's, his actions, his thoughts and intentions can change toward man in response to which side of God's program man chooses to be. Every mention of God and uh, the words repent or repenting, they're always found within the context of man's choice of either disobedience or obedience to God. We can look at that a few examples um, in Nineveh, a very common one found in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned away uh, from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And while God declared that he was going to destroy Nineveh, he sent Jonah to tell them that exact message. But because they repented, they chose to be on God's side of the program. They chose to repent from their sins. God withheld his hand of judgment and extended mercy towards them. Another example, the flood. Uh, Genesis 6, 5, and 7, we see this mention of God repenting. Uh, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God knew the hearts of men, and he was very aware that there was nothing in them that indicated that they were going to repent of their sins. And so God decided he was going to wipe off them from the face of the earth. And man and mankind had chose which side of the program they wanted to be on. They wanted to be on the side of themselves and serving themselves. And so God in his holiness and justice enacted judgment on that case. And so this repent was not a change of mind, but it was a grievance of his heart. It was uh, man had chosen disobedience for God. And we also see another example found in Mount Sinai in the Old Testament in Exodus. When Moses had gone to the peak to uh, talk with God and receive the Ten Commandments on those occasions. But meanwhile, the Israelite camp, they were uh, making a golden calf. Uh, committing wicked acts and idolatry. And so we see in Exodus 32, 9 through 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And then we find that Moses, he intercedes for the people, and he pleads on behalf of them to spare them of this evil, that God will fulfill his promise. Uh, and then later in the chapter, in verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil which he had thought to do to his people. But the, the thing is here, God would have broken no promises if he decided to wipe out Israel. If he decided to continue the line with Moses, he would still be fulfilling the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all those things. They would have been completed through Moses. So, yet God chose mercy in response to Moses. God is immutable in his character and his attributes, so this choice to spare Israel, it didn't compromise any of those things. Uh, as David Guzik puts it, he says, quote, Moses' prayer did not change God, but it did change the standing of the people in God's sight. The people were now in a place of mercy, when before they were in a place of judgment. Moses stood in their place, the children of Israel, on behalf of them, and pleaded for the Lord for mercy in hopes that one day Israel would one day ultimately choose the righteous side of God's program. So over and over again, we see that it's a matter of man. Which side does man choose to be on? Are they going to obey or disobey? And God, explain, and God explains that in this case of man's repentance, God will grant mercy in such cases. We find in Scripture in Jeremiah, he, he mentions kingdoms and uh, people of such. If they repent, he will grant mercy. Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8 says, At what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull it down and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. 
So later in Isaiah, just a few chapters later, in chapter 26, verse 13, Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. So after uh, an inspection of these examples that we've shown, many may claim that uh, using that the use of the word repent in these passages is an immediate contradiction with any semblance of immutability with God. But however, upon further inspection, it's clear that God's reactions to man's choices, they do not compromise his unchangingness. Difficult as the concept may seem, the contradiction's validity does not stand up when you're looking at these examples in Scripture. 